What's up, Doc? What do you want to get for lunch? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Bones. I'm, I'm really kind of anxious. I want to get this video out. I got a thousand things to cover, and uh, I'm not even really that hungry. Maybe we can just skip lunch. <gasps> I'm starving my bones off. Oh, if you're gonna be a baby, I could have the wife bring you a sandwich. Or <laughs> we could wait for dinner, and then we'll be cooking for Jesus. You always have to say that. Oh, Mr. Bones, don't be silly. I'm always cooking for Jesus. Ah, Jesus, the camera, uh, we're live. Is it? <gasps> and we're back, Mr. Bones, we're back. What do you think about my outfit, huh? Oh, you're so bright and sunshiny. Yes, I have to thank our buddy, Pastor James Smith at PreachTheLoveOfGod.com for sending me this gorgeous outfit. Got yellow sweats too. And uh, I tell you, God kind of Give me an inspired vision. I saw myself all over town in different places near the road, highway, traffic, that kind of thing. And uh, people just driving by, seeing this crazy guy, right? And then when the rapture happens, this image <laughs> will come to their mind. <gasps> I remember I saw that guy. It's so outstanding, right? They're gonna remember. And then when everybody goes, they're gonna be like, <gasps> where's that guy in yellow? It was a warning, it was a sign from God. So hey, that's what I'm trying to do, right? This is a warning, this is a sign from God. So uh, I got a lot of things to cover, but I'll tell you what, uh, I know how people are. And um, so I'm gonna tell you my thoughts on when I think the rapture is. So if you're not interested in uh, what I think, I'm gonna try to approximate the time period. Uh, I'm not setting the time period, you know. I believe it's around Passover, and God set the Passover by the sun, moon, and stars and his feasts. So I'm going to tell you why I think it's around the Passover, and I, I truly mean that. You know, it could be many days before, the 8th, the 10th, on Passover day, the 14th, the 17th, Resurrection Day. That's my favorite, honestly. And I'll tell you what that equates to on the Gregorian calendar. It's about April 13, I think. Or no, no, I'm sorry. I think, I think it's around April 10th is Resurrection Day. So uh, we're going to go over that. But, um, you know, Mr. Bones, some people uh, just get so upset when I tell my thoughts, even though I clearly don't know the day. I, I have not heard from God, open up the sky, <laughs> speak to Barry, my son. Hearest thou the word of God? Thus saith the Lord. The date of the rapture is this or that. Now go tell everybody. I haven't heard any of that, okay? We are studying his word. And Warning. The following video contains conjecture and prognostication about the day of the rapture. It is rated TVMA and is intended for mature audiences only. It is also rated eagle level wisdom and is intended for mature watchmen only those who dig deep viewer discretion is advised now remember mr bones god said teach me not to number my days don't look because you won't see the day approaching surely he won't tell his prophets so it's not in here what he is about to do that's surely you are in darkness. You are not children of the light. I want you to be ignorant. The heavens don't declare squat. The day won't come at the appointed time. And you know what? Those Pharisees, I wasn't really upset with them that they didn't know the time of their visitation. I know I might have called them hypocrites, but uh, I was just joshing. Uh, Dr. Berry. Is that really what the Word of God says? Oh no, Mr. Bones. These were collected from comment sections. Oh, uh, some people don't read the same book we do, do they? Exactly, Mr. Bones, because the Word of God actually says quite the opposite. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasures. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, 
Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath already been of old time, which was before us. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. And now I have told you before it come to pass over, that when it is come to pass over, ye might believe. God says in Psalm 90, 12, he says, teach me to number my days. Right after he says the generation of a man is 70 to 80 years. We're going to read that Psalm, but he says, teach me to number my days that I might apply my heart unto wisdom. So when I find out that from Nebuchadnezzar to the Dome of the Rock is the same number of years God said, and from the time the daily sacrifice was taken away by Nebuchadnezzar, and the abomination that makes desolate was set up, the Dome of the Rock, shall be twelve hundred and ninety days, a day for a year. Blessed is he who cometh to the thirteen hundred and thirty-five days, or years, which brings us to the end of 2022. That gets my attention. That, that sets my heart towards wisdom. That gets me more on fire to evangelize with a uh, urgency, okay? When I see that exactly 2,520 years from Nebuchadnezzar, from the time he takes Jerusalem, from the time that he became insane for seven years, that you go down and it's the start of World War I, or when Hitler's appointed chancellor, or the Nuremberg trials, and the year 1946, the Hebrew year 5707 is coded right in the Bible. And the year that Israel would be born in a day, 1948, coded in the Bible over and over and over again. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given us assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. On Resurrection Day 117. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an exact hour and day and month and year, for to slay a third part of the men. This is the reduction of the waters that will happen, and it is appointed. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city, and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do no thing, but he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. When the voice of the seventh angel sounds, the mystery of God should be finished, just as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. God is perfect. Hey, I got to throw this in because I always forget. If you take the number of years from, let's, let's uh, go with the, the number that we now agree. This is what Gary at unsealed.org. This is what he got to for a start date, 3971 BC. And CJ Lovick also agrees with that same start date, 3971 if you take 3971 and go to when Abraham was born, now he wasn't born in 1948, but this is even more cool, okay? He was born in 2023, and that was exactly 900, 1948 years before the year zero or the turnover year, okay? So you understand what I'm saying? 1948 plus 2023 is... 3971. That's the number of years. So Abraham was truly born in 2023. Does that year sound familiar? But it was 1948 BC, right? So 
you know, because it, it, it's it's been clearly shown that Abraham's father started having children when in the year 1948, but Abraham wasn't his first child. He's listed first because he's where the patriarchy will come through, and that was a common practice in, in writing the Bible. But he was born in 1948 B.C. So he has Abraham being born 1948 years before year one, and then Israel being born 1948 after. Abraham was born in 2023, and here we are in 2000. Well, we're about to turn into 2000, the true 2023 at Passover. So is that so cool, Mr. Bones? All right. So that just, that just really keys in. God is saying 2023 and 1948 are tied together by 75. Israel's 75. Something's going to happen this year, don't you think? What do you think, Mr. Bones? Uh, Dr. Berry, uh, Abraham was a Jew, am I correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. And so he is the father of the Jews. So um, why does that matter to us when he leaves his land? Well, that's a good point. That, that brings me, let's go to Galatians 3.26. As I bet a lot of people have the same question, Mr. Bones. Galatians 3.26. For ye are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. And when it says Greek here, that's the Gentiles. So there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that means we are grafted in, and Abraham is our father. We are the seed of Abraham, and we are heirs to the inheritance of Abraham's seed. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so am I. So let's go praise the Lord. Howdy do. Yes. Excellent, Mr. Bones. So we are the children of Abraham. And through our promise, through Christ, we inherit his promise. So when Abraham was told to leave his father's land at the age of 75, and that he was born in 2023, which was 1948 backwards, Israel born in 1948, 75 years later is 2023. These things are looking really good. We keep saying God requires that which has already been. It will be replayed. Wait just a minute. I want to recognize some channels. You know, this has been a giant group effort, and I believe it is God that gives us the will and power to do for his good pleasure. This is all part of his warning process because he said, Surely, Mr. Bones, surely I will do no thing unless I tell my servants, the prophets, and he is doing that again in type and shadow with us right now. This information was collected over years, studying with everybody. I am really tuned in to the date. I want the time. I want to know how many days till we're out of here or what is the best possibility. None of us have heard from God that he told us the date. So, so we can't ever say we know for sure. But we can tell you the time we think it is. I think it's around Passover, which is going to be around April 10th. Actually, Resurrection Day. That's my favorite. But it could be any of the days of Nisan. It actually could be the day before Nisan, which is what our friend Pastor Sandy is looking at. But again, there are some of us really tuned in. Some of us are called to sit back, preach the gospel, tell us soon. Some are called to point out the events in the world. Some are called to point out what the Antichrist is doing. And it's all a big, beautiful pie. And we're all a slice of pie, right? So I want to point out some of the slices that I really love. C.J. Lovick at Rock Island Books just knocked it out of the park with this last one. And he, he pointed out the exact same start date that I think that I'm in agreement with and also that um, Gary at Unsealed.org is, is looking at. And um, I'm going to try to show a little bit of that video and also uh, Gary's website where you can look at the timeline. From my independent studies and also 
gathering information from people that were a lot smarter than me, um, I came to the exact same conclusions. I always felt like God's perfection would cause it to be that Jesus was crucified in the 30th year AD, and then 40 years later would be destruction of the temple at 70 AD. Those are God's perfect numbers. And Jesus being born 3 BC made him 33 and a half or 33.3 if you want. So th those numbers fitting so perfectly, I love that. So seeing his start date, 3971, and mine, and Gary's, and everybody's on, on the same page. These are the things that work out the best. And again, I'll point out in CJ's, starting from the 30 AD mark of crucifixion, then counting seven times seven punishment of 40 years brings us right to this year, 2023. Here's his channel, Rock Island Books, and that is the video. Listen to the warning of the Lord God repeated four times in order that no one miss it. Listen carefully to what the Lord says so that you might immediately begin to unravel the mystery of this end times calendar. In Leviticus 26, 18, we read, And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. In Leviticus 26, 21, we read, And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sin. In Leviticus 26, 24, Then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet even seven times for your sins. And finally, in Leviticus 26, 28, Then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Now let's ask the question that unlocks the Lord's end time calendar. In the space of the 40 years from the crucifixion of Yeshua, Despite all the pleadings of God's apostolic prophets to the nation of Israel to repent of the horrific blindness and unbelief that resulted in the murder of the Son of God by one of the most cruel methods ever designed by mankind. Despite that, did national Israel and its leaders heed the pleading of the Apostle Peter or the other apostles? Did they listen to Stephen? No, they treated Stephen and all those they could get their hands on. All those that had received Messiah Yeshua, just like they treated the prophets of old, they murdered them in cold blood. Stephen was stoned to death. Peter and all the rest of the apostles, except John, were put to death for the testimony that Yeshua was the long-awaited Messiah. The 40 years between the crucifixion and the destruction of the temple was not a time when national Israel and its leaders repented, but rather doubled down on their rejection and unbelief of Yeshua. They would not have Yeshua rule over them. You can hear the words of the Lord echoing through this 40 years of testing. Leviticus 26:18. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Seven times forty years. The forty years between the crucifixion and the destruction of the temple from the start date of 70 A.D. equals 280 years. Seven times forty equals 280. If you add 280 years to 70 A.D., you arrive at the fourth century year of 350 A.D. So let me ask you, did Israel repent of their iniquity in the 4th century? All you need to do is read the insertions into the Talmud made during that period, and you'll discover that not only did they not repent, but they doubled down on their scorn and malicious slander against Yeshua the Messiah. Can you hear the words of the Lord echoing through this additional 280 years of testing? Leviticus 26.18 And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Seven times 280 equals 1,960 years. 1,960 years minus 280 years, the 280 years of time served, equals 1,680 years. We have now come to the moment when the prophecy spoken so long ago, an ancient prophecy that hardly anyone pays any attention to, bursts into our sight and illuminates the minds of them that are patiently waiting for Christ to return. The Ezekiel prophecy that begins with the 40-year time out between the crucifixion and the destruction of the temple, is compounded by the Lord who applies a promised seven-year multiplier to every period he allows for repentance when there is no repentance. We only know that the Lord compounded the timeouts twice because of another prophecy in which the Lord declares that he will bring unrepentant Israel back into the land in a condition of unbelief. This happened on May 14, 1948. So how much time to repent and believe does Israel have now? that the Lord has returned them to the promised land. 
How much longer before Israel enters into the final 70th week of Daniel? A time of great tribulation that according to Zechariah, Zechariah 13 verses 8 and 9, will result in the repentance and salvation of one-third of Israel. When is that going to happen? Ezekiel has the answer. Let's review it carefully a couple more times so there is no mistake or confusion about how all this fits into God's prophetic timepiece and where we are on his divinely appointed calendar. 70 AD plus 280 years brings us to the year 350 AD. If you then, starting with 350 AD, add 1680 years, it brings us to the year 2030 AD. Let's go over it one more time so there's no confusion. 70 AD plus 280 years plus 1680 years brings you to 2030 AD. Or put another way, 70 AD plus 1960 years brings you to the year 2030. The Ezekiel 40-year prophecy that found its fulfillment in 30 AD has blossomed into three prophetic additions that add 1960 years to the year 70 AD and brings you and I just months away from the time's up end of the prophecy that expires in the year 2030 AD. What does this all mean? Does it mean that we now know the year when the blindness and unbelief of Israel is going to be replaced by repentance and faith in the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah? Does it mean the Messianic Kingdom is about to begin? Does it mean the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week, is going to come to its conclusion in 2030 AD? And just so you don't miss it, the number of years between 70 AD and 2030 AD is exactly 1960 years. So why is that important? 1960, as it turns out, divided by 49 equals 40. Or put another way, 40 Jubilee cycles. To be clear, 7 times 7 accounts for the two prophetic times the Lord multiplied the original 40-year period allowed for belief and repentance. If you multiply the 40 years that God allowed for Israel to repent between the proposed cross event in 30 AD and the destruction of the temple event that took place in 70 AD, then this is what it looks like on God's calendar. 7 times 7 equals 49. Now, as you all know, 49 is the number of years between all the Jubilee cycles, with the actual Jubilee beginning on the 50th year. What happens when you multiply 49 times 40? The answer is that I believe we get a period of time on God's calendar that has special significance. 40 is the number of testing, and we're multiplying it by 49, the number that represents the years before a Jubilee. 49 times 40 is 1960. As we've already calculated, 1960 plus 70 AD brings us to the year 20. This is their website, and the timeline is right here. And uh, I'm going to do my best. This is a tablet, not a computer. But uh, he shows uh, the sh approximate Shemitah. This is the year that we're currently tracking. And a Hebrew year, you know, it always straddles to Gregorian. And uh, so he's got the rapture at the coinciding with the end of 2022. Same thing we're saying. Anno Mundi is from Adam. So he would say that coincides with 5993 and that 2030 would be 6000 and then entering into 6001. And this this thing just goes all the way over. So the 483 from the second decree to rebuild Jerusalem by Suleiman the Magnificent brings us again to this exact timeline but I want to jump down here and show a few more things all right so again crucifixion date 3031 I'm in total agreement Jesus ministry starting in 27 I'm in agreement going to his birth 3 BC yes conceived Hanukkah 4 BC, exactly what I think. And he also points out how these coincide with the Shemitahs. And uh, I mean, you, you got to take some time on this chart and also watch his video explanation. But let's go down. So we're in BC now. And we're heading towards when Abraham was born. Abraham was born in 1949 and 1948 BC. 
So that would be from Adam. He's got 224 here, but but I'll show you his his start date of creation is 3972 to 71. So from 71, it would be 1948, and this would be 2023. So he says uh, that um, Terah was 145 when he had Abraham. So let's just go all the way back. I mean, he's even got when uh, Joseph, um, you know, helped them through the famine, the seven years of uh, plenty and the seven years of famine, everything fits with these times and when they exited. But um, again, that's what, that's the only difference. But from the 3971, do the math, 2023 and 1948 become the same year. Okay, so you can look at that. So I love that. Bob Barber at End Time Dream and Vision. I love his timeline that he worked on, and I especially love how he pointed out World War I and World War II happening within those Shemitah cycles and being an exact number of Shemitah cycles to this Shemitah being the World War III. And the patterns are excellent. Um, Jakku! Jakku at God's Roadmap to the End. His harvest model and what he taught about the harvest, this, I, I, I was looking at stuff from four or five years ago. Uh, that I had learned from him and have always kept in my mind. And so this is one of the most important things is how God harvests a field. Because we all have heard that Passover was fulfilled when he resurrected a group of Old Testament saints, then that means he fulfilled the barley harvest. I say no. When he resurrected, he was the first fruit, but this group was the first fruits. So then Jesus has not fulfilled the main harvest of the barley, and the barley harvest it has the most beautiful rapture picture. We're going to go over it again. And then there's the gleanings. And then there's a wheat harvest that he was the first fruits. Jesus was the first fruit when he ascended on Shavuot to fulfill Moses' prophecy of him. And he was the first fruit of the wheat. He'll come back for the main harvest and then the gleanings at the end. So all those things are critical. And again, Jacko Yaku uh, did the best job of explaining that harvest. I also got a lot of information from Perry Stone. Perry Stone did a video. I know some people are, you know, have different opinions on all these guys, but you know, we, we need to open our mind and learn from, from everybody. So Perry Stone did a great job of explaining, you know, a, bar a barley harvest, all the barley is tossed onto a white sheet. You know, it's, it's, it's beat, the, the branches are beat to, for the seeds to fall off. But then on a white sheet, it's tossed in the air and the wind blows off the chaff. Well, the word for wind is ruach and that's the name of the Holy Spirit. So, talk about a Christian. You know, we get beat a little bit, but we're on the sheet. We hear his word and we go through tribulation because of his word, but then we are tossed in the air, a white sheet, just like the clouds, and the Ruach blows off this old chaff. Okay, that, and then what is left is white pearly barley. It's exactly the rapture scenario. So the main harvest is a barley harvest, but then how do you harvest wheat? You run over it with a board with rocks and stones and jagged edges, and a, a donkey or some men are standing on top of this board and this board is being drug around the wheat because wheat has a very hard shell and it crushes open the wheat and then you collect it. That board is called a tribulum. So we all have, again, we, we, we jump to conclusions. You see a picture of, oh, he fulfilled this and this and this, but he didn't fulfill that. And the next one to be fulfilled is this. And it's like, you got to think bigger, okay? How many feasts does the Lord have, actually? Oh, everybody knows seven. Yes, that's what everybody says. God has 
seven of his feasts that he shared with Israel in Leviticus 23. But let's count his feasts, Mr. Bones. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. That's three. Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, is a feast of weeks. They are separated 50 days or seven Sabbaths from, from this feast. Thank you. Gives us to the first Pentecade festival of wheat, or as the Bible calls it often, corn. Then 50 more days or seven Sabbaths, the first fruit of the wine. And the wine is one of God's feasts. The wine must be poured out on the altar. And he did it. Exactly at the time you should offer the first fruits of the wine. And then the first fruits of the oil. So in the Bible, 18 different times it says, bring me the first fruits of your corn, wine, and oil. So we know he has the first fruits of wheat, but he didn't share with the Jews the wine and the oil. Remember, they were rebellious and worship a golden calf. And instead of drinking the wine cup of the marriage covenant, they drank the wine cup of wrath. So we got three, now we got six. Corn, wine, oil. Then we got the fall feast. Trumpets, yam kippah, and sukkot, which is tabernacles. So there's three more, now we're at nine. What do we got, what's the rest? Hanukkah, that's a feast. Feast of Trees. Yes, it is. Purim. God recognizes Purim and fulfilled Purim and fulfilled Purim two more times with Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. Saving the Jews on Purim. Okay, so that's 12. So God has 12 feasts, Mr. Bones. Again, this is the kind of things that when God says, I'm going to close up the books and seal them, and they're going to be open at the end and many will run to and fro through the scroll, and knowledge of God's purpose will be increased. This is where we're at right now. We're at knowledge being increased. Um, Pastor Mark Biltz, his timeline, you know, we've all watched. I think he was right about the Shemitahs, but again, I think it just extends to the very last day of Adar and into Nisan for our exit. Um, PD and Lori at Prophetic Watchman 88. I especially love their one where it's a picture of half a lion and half an eagle. You got to watch that one. That one's so great. Okay, guys. So, uh, Thanks to all you and all the others that are watching, but th those are the ones uh, recently that have contributed to this video. So I will be back at the next segment. All right, so how you doing, Mr. Bones? Still hungry. Oh, Mr. Bones. Okay, what can I get for you? Pie. Pie? It's the middle of the day. I would like to partake of your pecan pie. Oh, can uh, we get Mr. Bones, prima donna, some pie over here? Okay, well, while we're waiting for that, I got something important I want to cover. You see, the Lord told us in his word that the whole word is about him. So let's go to Luke 24, 25 through 27. This is after he resurrected. He's walking on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples, expounding on the word. And Emmaus means warm bath. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So he was saying, hey, remember all, what all those prophets were saying? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, and that's the books of Moses, not when Moses was born. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. Jump down to 32. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and when he opened us the scriptures unto us. So God says, all these scriptures about me and all these stories are actually about me. From Adam to Cain to Enoch, Jared, Methuselah, his death shall bring. Noah, Moses, Joshua, on and on. All the stories are about him. Let's go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 7. Then said I, 
Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. The whole volume of the book. Every single part. To do thy will, O God. Remind me, we're going to go back to Hebrews 10 and explain one of the scariest verses in the entire Bible. But before that, let's go to Psalm 90. Oops. Okay. It's impossible to truly understand all of the value of this word without understanding typology. It, it's, it's really crippling to try to teach the word without understanding his typology because his type is prophecy. It said, God said, the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony, you know, this is the Old Testament, New Testament. The testimony is this whole word. And that's the spirit of prophecy. So when you hear about Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helpmate. That's a story about Jesus. God created everything. He created the angels for one service. He created mankind. But it was not good for God to be alone without bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. So we will be changed likened unto him. And we will be as him. As we see him, we will be changed and we will be bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, his bride. That's what he wants. God is searching for hearts. He's searching for true love. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. Searching their hearts. Looking for traces of what he's dreaming of. Hoping to find a friend and a lover. He'll bless the day he discovers another heart. Looking for true love also. So, Adam pulled from the ground. Jesus, after he died from the resurrection, pulled from the ground. The Spirit of God, he breathed into him and brought his life, the Holy Spirit. But Adam was put to sleep and pierced on the side and the rib taken out to access his heart, and his wife was made for him, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. That's the story of Jesus, but what's the story of? This is the Passover story. That's Jesus on the cross, being put to sleep and pierced on the side, and out came blood and water. So every story is like that. So again, if you read every story over again, and look for which, which one's Jesus. You'll see his side characters too. You'll see the bride. You'll see a father. You'll see two sons, two brothers. You'll see an older brother oppressing a younger brother. But every single story, the volume of the book is about Jesus. So Psalm 90, I want you to hear it with typology. Hear it as prophecy. Because it's very easy to quote that verse. The generation of man is 70, 80 years. But why do we know he's talking about the end time and about the tribulation? Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Number one, he keys you into the word generation. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever, thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. From the beginning to the end. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men. I often think about this. You know, God set us into the world and let us go free. Go wild. Boys and girls gone wild. And go as, as far prodigal as you can get. And he just, from his little book, just whispered, Find me. Come back to me. Because with true love, you know, you let it go. If it comes back to you, it's, it's true love. If it, if it doesn't, it was never yours. All right? <sighs> Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are as but yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So again, he, he ties us into the 6,000-year plan and the watches. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. Rapture scenario. 
They are as a sleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed in thine anger. When are we going to be consumed? That was the prophecy. The next destruction comes by fire. We are consumed in thy anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. This is those that aren't saved. Okay, let's make that clear. He is going to take his bride, Eleazar, the Holy Spirit, is going to bring the bride to him. Keep us out of the trouble. His iniquity, his fire, his wrath is towards those that are still in their own sins. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. Jacob's trouble. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. For, our, for all our days are passed away with wrath, and our years are spent as a tale that is told. That's how the tribulation is going to be. It's going to be all spent out, and it'll be a tale that's told forevermore. The days of our year are three score and ten, which is 70 years. Or if, reason, or if by reason of strength, and that, that word uh, ties to pride and rebellion. So who, who's going to be left behind? Pride and rebellion that reject Jesus Christ. If by reason of pride and rebellion they be 80 years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow. Tribulation, labor, and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we all fly away. What's that now? So everybody that is, uh, you know, 70 to 80 years, at, at some point they just fly away? And we're not talking about resurrection, right? No, he's talking about at the end. They will fly away at the end, at this 80-year junction. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to do this so that we may apply our hearts. And not only that, that we can reach others. You know, you know, I have this in my office and I see many people per week. And uh, often I'll get asked about it and I love it. Uh, I usually get in trouble for my wife for uh, taking too long with patients, but um, it gives me a chance. And I'll tell you the most exciting thing, you know, you can say rapture's coming and you get the eyes, right? You can say, oh, you know, it seems like the end times and, you know, people still think things are getting better. But I show them timelines and it stops them in their tracks. When I show them that Israel is 74 and there's a prophecy of them going only to 80, and in the Left Behind movie that we just saw, there, you know, these people are still rejecting, even though, uh, oh, I, I wish it was still out. And, and maybe, you know, we can all search for it and it'll be released on another platform. That's what I'm hoping and pay for it. If you haven't seen it, you have to do whatever you can to see it. It's so good. It's so Christ based, unlike the other ones, honestly. But um, they show that the rapture was debunked, right? So that's why it's so important that we are louder now because. There are going to be people that are seeing us and then see us all disappear. And there won't be any of this stuff left or any of this or any of this, right? And they showed that the guy, uh, the husband, was trying to search the vanishing and the rapture and there were no search items found because that's, they're already censoring us. So you know the day it happens, they're going to be like, we got to shut all that down, make it just disappear down the rabbit hole, as they say. So... One of the guys, he, he hears these guys trying to convince him. He's the reporter, Buck. And, and they're showing him timelines and how the tribulation is going to go. And they're like, you know, uh, they, they're going to ask to build a, a temple. And there's going to be a seven-year tribulation. And in the middle of the tribulation, you know, the, the Antichrist is going to come in. So uh, then the guy goes to the meeting with, with all uh, the Israel, and he's trying to expose these guys, right? And he still doesn't believe. And then the Jewish guy that's ahead of um, negotiations with the Antichrist, he goes, well, we're, because of this deal we're making, oh, how long's the deal? Oh, seven, it's a seven year, it's only a seven year deal. And the guy's face goes white. And he goes, but, but that gives us our temple. 
And so the guy had already been like, there's no way you're going to build a temple on the uh, uh, Temple Mount because of the Dome of the Rock. And they said, no, they found out that it's going to be the true border is right next to it. So that's what saved him. All these things that we've been saying, when, when the great deception comes and they say it was aliens and they debunk the rapture. And again, if you, if, I hope and everybody saw it, but if you didn't, I hope this isn't a spoiler, but um, oh, such a, such a evil and, 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 and just probable thing that happened was after the, the rapture and everybody's in confusion and they debunk the rapture right on the news, then they, they uh, fake a second disappearance. So, but you know, in the movie they exposed, nobody actually witnessed anybody. Like the first time everybody knew somebody. And then the second one, so they end up finding it was faked. But that's, that's the kind of thing that will happen. So this, you know, we still got a chance. You know, I, I think we have reached everybody that was reachable, save maybe a few, a few last ones. But we have this great chance to be an impact in this Left Behind series. All right, let me finish this up real quick. <sighs> teach us to number our days. Teach, literally teach us to do this that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Is that, is that the song in all our hearts right now? Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. He says, the psalmist is crying out, satisfy us early with your mercy and make us glad for all the trouble we're going through right now and all the evil we've seen. Our hearts are just crying out to God because the injustice is so great. We just need a rescue. So when will the rescue come, Mr. Bones? At the appointed time. Good one. You actually picked up something from being with me this long. All right, we're going to go over the appointed times. But before I go, let's check out my shirt from Jimmy James. Okay, this was, this was my idea. And I'm already wearing this at work and people wanting to know the answer. It's so cool. So Adam and Eve lost it. You go to hell without it. Jesus Christ came to win it back. What is it? And it shows this little thinking cap guy, right? And a lot of people don't know, even the Christians sometimes don't know. And you know, you remind them and they're like, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what I thought. I was just afraid to say, right? But the Spirit of God was breathed into Adam. Eve was brought out. They were sinless before any of this happened. And when they partook of sinning, basically bowing the knee to Satan, disobeying the one, he made it really easy. Let's give you one thing to obey. And that's where we are right now. That was the typology. I always used to wonder, why was it only one thing? Because salvation is one thing. Do you eat the bread and drink the blood of Jesus Christ and his work. One thing is how you're saved. One thing is how they lost it. And it goes back to eating. So when they bowed to Satan and chose to disobey that one thing and eat of, it was actually power. It was the knowledge of, I make my own choices of what's good and evil. The spirit of God left them and they became naked. And they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. And in the gematria, you can find fig leaves and the Torah or the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the commandments, the 613 commandments uh, tie in together. I forget how, but anyways, so Jesus came literally to win it back, to buy it back. Because redeemed means to buy back from lawful captivity with a price. The price was his perfect blood. So he had to spill, he had to have perfect blood, walk perfect blood, spill perfect blood willingly, take all the punishment for all the sins of the world to take away the sin punishment for any who would trust in him and eat of his tree of life. 
So his blood bought us back. And we're going to tie into the tribulation and the difference in the words of redemption or gathering or gleaning, etc. So I just wanted to put that part in. Jesus said, the entire thing is about me. So when he says this story about Moses, can you see this? Okay. Moses was instructed, put blood on the door. Jesus was instructed, put blood on the door. And anybody with the blood of the innocent lamb on the door would be saved from the angel of death. So that's a story about Jesus. And that was on the 14th day of the first month, Nisan 14. And they were to roast the lamb whole because no bones could be broken because the lamb is now about Jesus. And they roasted it whole and they consumed it with their loins girded and shoes on their feet, sandals on their feet, and the staff in their hand, they were ready to go. Jesus, that's the only time where Jesus said to do that. I want you to celebrate this particular feast ready to go. And eat that lamb and make sure that blood is on your door. The door of your heart. And stay in that house. They could have left the house and left the protection of Jesus. But he said, stay in that house, that blood covering. That's about keeping your faith, the good fight of faith, all the way till the end. You never wander out and say, well, you know, maybe Jesus was just a prophet. Or, you know, uh, maybe he died for my sins, but, you know, I got to finish the work myself. I have to do a good enough job of not sinning and repenting and praying enough and getting baptized by water and all these other things that I add to. What did he say? Stay in the door. That's it. My blood is what causes the angel of death to pass. Then he brought him out on the 15th day of Nisan. They are leaving Egypt, and that represented Jesus going into unleavened bread. And then on resurrection day, Jesus is the one that opens the Red Sea, the great Red Sea in between us, and we, his people, cross over on dry ground. And then again, Jesus wandered with them for seven Sabbaths. And then he, Jesus, went up to meet God in the clouds, descended, and he went up in the cloud, received him, and he gave commandments. So Jesus fulfilled Shabbat because Moses did, because this story is really about Jesus. So when you trust that these stories are really about Jesus, then you see his timing. And you see, he didn't, Moses didn't go up 10 days early, and then on Shabbat, people get a gift given to them. These people were told not to come up. He went up by himself. Remember when Jesus went up, he gave commandments, just like Moses did. Jesus was taken up after he gave commandments. And then he went up into the clouds. And then the two witnesses showed up and they said, what are you looking at? He's going to come back the same way. Then, again, Moses was called back up and he was up in the mountains for another seven Sabbaths. And he, at the, in his timing, he sent his people to Jerusalem. He said, wait there. Not many days you're going to get the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So, when did he pour out the Holy Spirit? Read Exodus. From Exodus 19, 24, 32. You're going to see this exact story with the dates. And it's in the month of Av. Seven Sabbaths after Shavuot is the Feast of Wine. And you pour out wine on the altar. So, Jesus ascended fulfilling Shavuot as the first fruits of the wheat. Then from heaven, he poured out wine onto the altar, the 120 in the upper room. And then he went to make atonement. I believe he visited Paul on the Feast of Oil and anointed him as the preacher. But he's up making atonement. Now, this story jumps, it's another seven weeks, but it jumps 2,000 years. And he will come back on Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, just like Moses did, and his face will be shining. He'll remove the veil, just like this story of Noah. In the fall feast, the veil is removed. But the story of Noah, which is really about Jesus, when did the water start to asswag? 17th, well, on, on Passover, the Lord remembered Noah, remembered Jesus, caused a ruach, a wind, to pass over, and the water started to 
Ashwag. And then on the 17th day, resurrection day, 17th day of the converted calendar makes it the first month. So this is 117. The ark, Jesus Christ, and Noah, Jesus Christ, with the seven being the churches, comes to rest on the mountains of Ararat, which means reverse the curse. And that is the day the curse was reversed. And then the waters continue to Aswag until the first day of the fourth month, which is related to the end of all 12 tribes bringing their offering of Shavuot. And then he tells us exactly to the ninth of Av, a dove and a raven are released. Do you think when Jesus comes back that he will fulfill these? I know he will because his word speaks also in typologies because everything, every story is a typology of Jesus. So when you understand he was the lamb, he was the blood, he was Moses, he was Noah, he was Adam, he was Abel, he was Joshua, then all these dates start to really lift up in importance. So I just wanted to get that off my chest right off the bat. Now we're gonna teach a little bit, okay? I'll be back. Oh, Mr. Bones, I got another segment. Oh, please regale us with your wisdom, dear one. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Bones. Made me feel a little weird on that. Okay, so this is the, the overall typology of the Bible. Again, the whole thing's written about Jesus, and the first statement that really clues us in is when God looks at Adam, he's, he says, let us make Adam in our image, and he says, it is not good for man to be alone. It's not good for Jesus to be alone. So he says, I will take to myself a people. I will be your God and you shall be my people. I love this part. He says at the Exodus, Moses, he has Moses say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But in Hebrew, it says, stand still and see the Yeshua of Yahweh. Isn't that cool? I love that. So Exodus 6, I just want to read you the promises. Again, these promises were made for the Passover and the promises were fulfilled on Passover, except for one of them was not fulfilled. That was a Passover promise. They're all also representing the four cups of wine that they drink on Passover and they don't drink that last cup. It's undrunk. That cup is for who, Mr. Bones? Elijah. Elijah should come at Passover. What a perfect time for us to be raptured and Elijah and Moses show up on Passover when Elijah is prophesied to show up. Six months later, tribulation starts with the signing of a covenant. But let's go back to Exodus 6. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shall you see what I will do unto Pharaoh. After the rapture, God says, Now you will see what I will do unto Pharaoh, which is Antichrist. With a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand he shall drive them out of his land. For God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Yahuwah, or hand of grace, behold, nailed in grace, behold, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them. And I will give them the land of Canaan and the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have, rede I have remembered my covenant. So he's now hearing the groanings of us, his children, in our bondage to this evil world run by Satan, the prince and power of the air. So he remembers his covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So that's number one. He's going to bring us out from under this burden of the Egyptians. When we became Christians, we were granted a portion of that supernatural power through his spirit that we are not under his control. 
and I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you. He redeemed us on the day of the cross. His blood paid the price to wipe out the entire sins of the world so that whosoever in the future would choose to eat from that tree would be saved from the work that was done once and for all. He redeemed us with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take to you, I will take you to me for a people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Now, here's the cup not drunk. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage, that's your inheritance. I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. Okay? So we, we've been bought out. We, he's, he's given us supernatural protection against this world. We're still in amongst the world until he literally carries us into the promised land, which as seeds of Abraham, we are heir to the promises of Abraham, which is the promised land. And then that's a temporary seven-year promised land up there in heaven. Then we come back down and the earth will be remade in his image. He will bring his holy temple down and then we will have our promised land down here. Okay, so that's all in Exodus 6. He says, will you marry me? And he says, wait for me to come down with the marriage covenant. And they blew it. They had said, we can't wait for you. We, nobody knows the day or the hour when he's coming back. So they turned to a God of their own making and the marriage was off. This happened on the 9th of Av, the great provocation. Then the following year, he's bringing them through again. And he says, go into the land and spy it out. And they spy it for 40 days. Remember, in between these is 40 and 7 always. always. When they come out, which again is on the same day, the 9th and 10th of Av, and they say, nope, we're scared. And he says, oh, I'm about, God's is like, I'm frustrated with you. He tells Moses, I'm going to smite them all. And Moses is like, no, wait, don't rush to any decisions. And, and God says, I'll make a new people out of you, Moses, out of you, Jesus, because these have rebelled against me. But both of those events were on the 9th of Av. So as we've learned, seven Sabbaths from the 15th day of the third month brings you to the 8th of Av. So that was supposed to be the day they went into the promised land, the 8th of Av. But instead, the next day, they have the ninth of Av curse, and then they will walk through the wilderness for 40 years, but they had already served too. So it was 38 more years. And every year on the ninth of Av, they would dig their own graves, and the elders would lay in it. And every year, 15,000 men would die between the ages of, I think it was between, I think it was between 20 and 60. So 40 year gap. They had to lay in their, in their graves, 15,000 dying every year, then for a total of the 40 years of their wandering. So God's attention to numbers is what you can, you can never forget. And when we're looking for the approximate time of the rapture or the exact time of the rapture, we know he will follow those patterns that he has set. He says, I'll make a new people out of uh, you, Moses. And he's like, given a typology, he's going to make a new people out of Jesus. Jesus said... You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go away to build a place for you because we are getting married. I'm going to come to get you, my bride, and take you away. For the Lord himself shall descend in a cloud and... Mr. Bones, do you know what happens after the Lord himself des descends with the cloud? Uh, isn't there something like a shout and a trumpet? Yes, Mr. Bones. And then... In Christ, raise first. Read my shirt. It's on my shirt. I see it every day now. Yes. Here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 real quick. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And again, there's trumpets at each one of his feasts. And there's trumpets to say, come out my people or uh, we're going to war or something so that 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 one's tripped up everybody they just think the only last trump is at feast of trumpets not true at the last trump I, I i like to say it at the trumpet announcing the end or the last the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruption must put on incorruption 
This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. So I just want to highlight this part. We're going to be incorruptible, immortal, pearly white, a light unto ourselves, glowing. I'm not sure how that's going to look, but we are going to be shining bright like the stars. So that is a un or a sinless party. That is a sinless feast. So what is the only feast? Am I still in? Okay. Three feasts are required by God that all men shall appear before him in the place which he shall choose. That's Deuteronomy 16, 16. So we have the unleavened bread feast, which is representing sinless. This is a sinless feast, an incorruptible, immortal feast. No sin, no leaven. Then we got the Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, representing the wheat, and that is with leavened bread, representing sin. So that is a feast that still has sin. Then at Sukkot, it's gathering in all of the fruits of the land, and there's going to be mortal and immortal. So we know this happens at the end after the return of God with all of us, and the angels have gathered his people. So of the feast, leavened bread or unleavened, which one speaks of those that were changed incorruptible? And incorruptible means you can't be corrupted anymore. You can't sin anymore. We are in a body like Jesus that we can't sin anymore and immortal. So again, we're looking at a harvest that was not completed. The harvest typologies of Passover from the very first word of the Bible. Can you scoot up to that real quick once again? The word Bereshit, way up there top in red. When you tear that apart that word in Hebrew, you got the Father, the Son, the Son wearing a crown of thorns, hung on a tree, the gift, the redemption, all, all those things are in that word, but it's talking about Passover. The word is, is in the beginning, and it's also the first fruits, you know, like a, like a first fruit rapture, but it is representing the Passover. So that's the first, then Adam, a Passover typology, Cain, older brother killing the younger, Passover typology, all the other names. Noah, when do the waters start to disappear from the earth? The waters are the people, 17th day of the first month. When did Moses bring them through? 17th day of the first month. Joshua, Joshua brings them through on the 10th day. So that throws a little curveball. But they go through, then they get circumcised, and then they hold Passover. So I, that's why I like the idea of us going early and holding Passover, no matter what, I think we will. Uh, because, again, the Lord says he's going to gather us and, and have us all together. But 117 is his great code of divide. It means let it divide. And the Bible is divided by Psalm 117. And all these 117 codes, that's just how, how I, I think he's going to do it. The picture of Joseph, the picture of Jonah, of course, God on the tree. And, and bringing them out, that which has been done will be done again. And then John was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day. What was the Lord's Day? What's his big day? Resurrection Day. Okay? Now I want to talk a minute about Christ on the cross, the Passover. On the cross, he says this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you read that? Do you know where that shows up first? In Psalm 22. Jesus is quoting this on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy. Enthroned in the praises of Israel, our Father trusted you. They trusted, and you delivered them. 
They cried, and you were delivered. They trusted you, and were not ashamed. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by all people. Now we can see that this is Christ, right? And go home and read the entire thing of Psalm 22. It's powerful. We're going to come back to it, but I want to stop for a minute and talk about this worm thing. Why did he call himself a worm? Most teachings think because he set himself lower than man. That, that's true to, a, to an aspect, but all animals are below man. Right? Man has given dominion over the earth, so he could have called himself a rabbit, and that would have been below man. But he picked a worm. This is the original Hebrew. The word worm right there is tola'at. It's in the Strong's. That's 8438. That's the word that was used there. That's not the traditional worm, word for worm, like a maggot-type worm. This is a specific type of worm. And right here, it means crimson, purple, or worm. It is also used in Exodus when the people gathered too much manna, and it developed worms. It was this worm, a specific one. God didn't want them gathering too much manna. He wanted them to trust him. So I'm going to send a worm to destroy all the overstock that you got, and it's going to be that worm. So what does this mean? That is the crimson worm, or the cocos ilcus, the cocos worm. I'm going to talk a minute about this, because he referred to himself as this particular worm. This is a picture of it. This is a picture of it in its cocoon stage. Okay? It sticks up on the branches there. Here's some more pictures. They're really tiny. They almost look like sea, some kind of sea animal, but these are all these cocos worms. Now, what they do in Israel, they harvest these. Does so anybody know when they harvest snails to get the blue color for the threads? They used to take snails out of water, and if you opened them up in the daylight, it would give you a purple or a blue dye, and they would use that for their robes. These they would harvest to get a crimson color. So this is actually going on right now in Israel. This is a guy who sticks one of these worms right there in boiling water, and it ultimately starts turning red. Okay. Now we're going to go through this and pay attention because understand who Christ is, what he did for us, what he said to us, what he said at the Last Supper, and think about this. The Hebrew word for worm is ramah, which means maggot. But the Hebrew word Jesus used for worm was tola'ath, which means crimson or scarlet worm. When it is time for the crimson worm to reproduce, which it only does one time in its life, it finds the trunk of a tree or a wooden fence post or a stick. It then attaches its body to the wood and makes a hard crimson shell. It is so strongly and permanently stuck to the wood that the shell cannot be removed without tearing its body completely apart or killing it. You can already see where this is going, right? The crimson worm lays its eggs under its body as a protective shell. When the larvae hatch, they stay under the shell. The mother's body gives protection for her babies and also provides them with food, which is her own living body. And what does Christ say? Take and eat. This is my body. I am the worm. Take and drink. This is my blood. I am the worm. After a few days of feeding on the living mother's body, the young worms grow and the mothers die. It then secretes a crimson or red dye that stains the wood it's attached to and covers the young. The scarlet covering protects them from predators and it stains them red for the rest of their lives. This is what it looks like when you harvest these worms off of a tree. And what does that resemble? Christ has said, I am the worm. I am the scarlet worm. I will protect my kids. They take and eat. This is my body. And when I die, my blood will cover you. I will protect you from predators. We're not done yet. After dying to give life to its children, something amazing takes place. For a period of three days, the worm can be scraped from the tree and the crimson gel can be used to make a dye. This dye was the same dye used in the tabernacle and the garments of the high priest. For three days, you could harvest this dead worm and they would take the dye and it would actually be the covering of the Old Testament tabernacle. It was red. And they also used it in the garments of the high priest. That's just a coincidence, right? By the morning of the fourth day, when the worm has pulled its head and tail together, it now is in the shape of a heart. And it starts losing its crimson color and is now turning into a wax, which is white like snow. 
And what does Jesus say in Psalm 22? I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. And then in Isaiah, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they are now white as snow. For they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I am the worm. Everything he did was right there in the life cycle. And we can see everything in God in nature. This is why he said, I am this worm. I will feed my children with my body. I will protect them and cover them with my blood. It shall protect them against predators until they can stand on their own. And then they can harvest the blood because I'll be the high priest and their scarlet sins will be white as snow. Have you ever heard that before? You know, it's not an accident. You can't make this up and all you got to do is, you know, see it. It's so much more than him saying I'm lower than man. He was giving you an example, a physical example, and they would have known that because this worm grows in the Middle East. It grows in Israel. They're harvesting it now. Those pictures I showed you of them mixing it in the water, that's from the Temple Institute. Now, these Jews don't believe that Christ is the Messiah. They're trying to build the third temple. They're making the garments for the high priest. They're harvesting this worm because they know this worm, if we gather it within three days after its death, we can color our high priest robe red. This is Jews doing this today. You know, God knew. He, he hides himself in plain sight in nature. We just got to see it. Right? So, we can stop there, but we ain't done yet. Right? <laughs> he says, rise up, my love, my dove, come away. And then he says, come, my people. In, in the Song of Songs, he puts her in the clefts of the rocks. And he says, let me hear your voice one more time. Your face is so calmly and beautiful. Let me just hear you one more time. And then we say to him, we're telling him bid farewell. And we say, go take the foxes that spoil the vine. For the, the grapevines have tender grapes. Okay? So Jesus leaves us in heaven. He says, shut the door. Isaiah 26. Come, my people, enter in and shut the door until my fury be overpassed. We're going to go over this in detail. Again, Jesus comes back by himself in the tribulation without us. One time, the heavens are rolled back like a scroll, and they see him on the throne. The other time, heavens open, they see him on a horse with crowns. He's bathed in blood, and he has an army of us behind him. So that this has been the, the thing that has caused many to trip up. We think we're past the victory generation. I say when Israel is still 80 years old at the feast of Yom Kippur, the day of judgment, he'll come back and he'll fulfill the day of his vengeance and the year of his recompense. And that's the battle of Armageddon. That's when the blood goes up to the bridles. He comes back then bathed in blood. And then he rides out on horses with us. So we're going to go over that in more detail and I'll show you the verses. But man goes to his long way home. We all fly away. He sent, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me. And at that time, then two will be in the field. One will be taken as a friend or companion. The other shall be left divorced. Two will be grinding at the mill, one taken, the other one left. The virgins, half of them, don't have the oil. They were not born again. And so God says, away from me, I cannot see you where you're at because there's no fire burning. The high priest was in charge of keeping the fire burning in the temple constantly. If he let it go out, the thief in the night would come along, take a coal from the fire, light his linen garments on fire, which will burst into flames, and he would be instantly naked because all his clothes would just burn up and he's running naked. And, he, and that's what Jesus says, don't let you be found naked. And so they fell asleep. So when he says, I can't see those other virgins that don't have oil, that means they don't have, they weren't born again of the spirit. When he came back after Adam and Eve lost the spirit and they became naked and covered with fig leaves, he said, where are you? I can't see you. And they hid amongst the other trees. Isn't that interesting? They just kind of blend in with the other trees, the trees of the other nations. And what has Israel done? They just blended into the other nations. He said, I can't see you. So it wasn't because they weren't hot enough. It's because they didn't have the spirit of God. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, they'll know his name. I'll say, Jesus, Jesus. You know, the whole world knows the name Jesus. Many of them mock it and, and blaspheme it and make fun of it. And they will, they will say, hey, I, I knew you. 
but they were never born again. And so he says, I can't see you. I am taking, the Holy Spirit is in charge of taking the light out. It's not his choice at that point because it's the rule that he made. God made the rule, Mr. Bones. What's one of God's rules? Surely he will do no thing unless he tells his servants, the prophets. Exactly. So he has to tell us in type and shadow if it is. But who else has to? And I thank Lori for this one. Satan has to follow that same rule. And so Satan doesn't do it to mock us or laugh at us or rub it in our face. He has to do it. I've heard that people say they believe in karma and they'll have better luck or, or they won't have to pay for it if, if they tell. But he is required to tell everything he's going to do. So a lot of times he'll put it in a way so obnoxious, like on a cartoon or in a movie or a superhero movie, that we, we don't recognize it. But when Mr. Can I say Gates without being cut off? When he uh, developed a thing that will be tied to your money and tied to your biometrics, even your inner thoughts, and can, can read your, your whole life and, and monitor you, and he says you won't be able to buy or sell without it, and then he put the patent number 666 on it, it wasn't just that he made a silly mistake or that he was, again, joking or rubbing it in our face. It was because he was required to. And that is a type and shadow, just like all these are types and shadows of the real thing to come. The thing that is out right now is a type and shadow of what will come, but it cannot be released till the rapture, the restrainer's gone, then the antichrist comes up, then the false prophet causes all those to take the mark of the beast. Okay, so it has to be in that order. Rapture, we're gone. Restrainer's gone. Think of God taking his hand off the earth. Light is gone. Darkness, destruction, terror, all sorts of chaos. So the Antichrist has to rise up with the answers. Sign a seven-year covenant. Agree to make the temple that he is the one that wants that temple. Then the false prophet says, this is our way of control so we can bring peace and security. Everybody has to have this thing so we can monitor everything so your neighbors can't hurt you. We're doing this for your safety. And if you don't agree, we have these little schools you can go to. They're called in, in, entrapment camps or, or whatever. So, okay, uh, re-education camps. So that, that is uh, what's coming. Okay, one last thing on the uh, Church of Laodicea and the Church of Sardis. Sardis, he says, I will cast you into a bed of the tribulation and kill your children, etc., etc." We're talking about they're still in a mixed marriage with the Catholicism, which is an anti-Christian religion. So they are not born again. The Church of Laodicea, again, it is not talking that they were just not doing good enough in their Christian walk. They were never born again. That's why he says, buy gold from me. What's the only gold? When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and, and your belief in that is in your heart and you cling to that irrevocable, you have been covered over by his blood, given a snow white robe, and we are likened to gold and we have bought eternal treasure. He says, by eye salve that you can you know, clean your eyes out so you can see, it means you're blind. You, you, you think you're rich. In church, you're a churchgoer, you don't even know the salvation message. That Adam lost it, and you go to hell without it. And the blessed God came down and spilt his perfect blood to buy it back. And you have one thing you have to do. You have to eat of the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. So when you accept his work and know that he is God, he was born of a virgin to testify of his perfection. He walked perfectly without sin to testify of his divine nature. He spilled his blood, the only blood of a made mortal man, made sin, that could pay the price to wipe out the sins of the world. And then his resurrection, three days later, you know, I, I, I find a lot of people give the gospel, they really focus on the third day part, but the, the most important part was he came back from the dead um, in, in the Hebrew understanding, um, there's a, a tradition that if somebody died, you know, back then they didn't have apparently the sophisticated way to know if somebody was in a coma or deep sleep or, or dead. So there was a waiting period of three days. And that's why he waited for Lazarus to be dead four days before he came and raised him. It was, again, to testify he was really dead. So that's the part 
Jesus was really dead. He wasn't just sleeping. He wasn't faking there in the grave. He was really dead. And that's when he rose on the third day. And his resurrection into a new body is the proof of God. Okay? All right. I think that's all I wanted to cover on that segment. But is that kind of exciting to you? You're now seeing that of the appointed times of God's feast, which he said it will come at the appointed time, we had blood moons over and over and over again on Passover and Sukkot, Passover and Sukkot. We had the story of David that he ruled over Hebron for seven years and six months. The story of Solomon taking seven years and six months to build the temple. Rapture at Passover is six months before the fall feast when the tribulation should start. Then it will carry on for seven years. But six years into it, Jesus Christ will return himself in like 28, 29 at the Day of Atonement for the day of vengeance and the year of recompense. Here's three verses. It's going to be a day for a year and he's going to, you know, with, with all of what we've gone through, how much time was taken for everything to unfold, you understand, yes, he could snap his fingers, but he's going to have a year of pouring out his fury and we're going to be shut up there in heaven, being sanctified, just like the priests were sanctified in the, in the temple. They couldn't leave out the door for seven days. When, when Miriam, when, when she was mocking Moses about taking a Gentile bride, Mary, Miriam became a leper. And, and Moses and Aaron prayed for her to be healed. And the Lord said, If the father yet spit in his daughter's face, should she not be out of the camp for at least seven days? So representing Israel must be at least seven days. So there's all these connections where the Lord went... When a child is birthed, there must be seven days. With a marriage, there must be seven days. So that is why we must be locked in there. We can't come out till seven days, but he has the ability after working six years to come and do a year of recompense. Okay, that's how I'm putting it together. And one more thing about Moses and, and Miriam. Okay, so Moses took a Gentile bride. Guess who else took a Gentile bride that, that, that many people won't think of? Well, first of all, Adam literally took a Gentile bride because Abraham was the first man made a Jew. So, of course, they have the same bloodline and it could you know, be attributed that way. But Rebecca for Isaac, Rebecca came from the line of Abraham's father, who was not a Jew. So Rebecca was actually a Gentile bride. And again, we showed last time that, first of all, Isaac was born at, um, he, was, he was conceived at Passover and born at Hanukkah. But he received his bride at Passover in the springtime. I, I can't nail down Passover just with the word, but it's definitely in the springtime. And the fact that she was a Gentile bride, again, just feeds into that perfect unleavened bread rapture scenario. Okay. Also, I wanted to uh, highlight this shirt. This is one of my favorite ones to wear at work. It says, Jesus is king. So um, I had this Mormon lady that we've been friends with for years and years, and she knows my thoughts on Jesus, and she has different thoughts on Jesus. So she came in and, uh, you know, just saw the pretty colors and said, oh, I love your shirt. And I had a chance to just stand back, and <laughs> she looked right at it, and she's like, oh, Jesus is king, and just got a little bit quiet. And I said, and then on the side of it, it says shalom, which is peace, and then it says rapture. And then on the back of it, it says the Alpha and Omega. So again, I, I, you just got to testify when you can. I know that uh, with long-term friends, you, you feel like it, you might be exhausted out of it, but um, we just keep trying. Hey, Mr. Bones, yes. Can you tell me what do you think is the most popular verse in all the Bible? Oh, that's easy. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well done, Mr. Bones. Can you tell me the verse right before it? Uh, how about the verse right after it? Uh, uh, but I, wait a second, I, I think something about condemn the world. You're close. But let's go there, because this goes back to hearing the story. When God says salvation comes by faith, 
faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. But how shall they hear without a preacher? So go to John. Let's, let's start at the beginning of John. There was a Pharisee Nicodemus that came to ask Jesus, you know, what, what must we do to inherit life? And Jesus answered him and say, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is a law of God. Without being born again, he cannot be in the presence of God. We need to be supernaturally covered by his blood, which gives his light so that we can be reunited, incorruptible in the presence of God. It's not negotiable. God cannot break that rule. He wants to take everyone. So he wants everyone to be born again. They cannot. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. And the water is of the word. It's not required to have a water baptism, although that's awesome cannot enter into the kingdom. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So remember, Jesus said, if the days weren't shortened, no flesh would survive. He didn't say no spirit would survive. So he shortened into the days for those left behind. But Adam lost the spirit of God. You go to hell without it your eternal separation from God without it. Jesus came to buy it back. You have to hear his story, believe on him, cling to and adhere to him, and believe till the end. The battle of faith is to keep believing till the end, to not walk out of that door with the blood on it and go to believe in carefully crafted fairy tales. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind bloweth, and whenever you hear wind, think of the Ruach or the Holy Spirit. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto them, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Okay. Master of Israel, he knows the word inside and out. He knew Adam and Eve lost it and that the curse came after that. The Spirit of God left and they were naked. So he, he's kind of puzzled. How do you not know this? And you also know the prophecy of the son that would come to redeem the world. Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I told you of earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man ascendeth up into heaven, but he that cameth down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. The blessed God shall come down teaching. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So they already had the typology that they were bit by snakes, they were dying. What must they do to be saved? Man must be made sin and hung on a pole, and we look on him and believe in God. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. Now we get to the favorite verse. After all that story, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So Adam lost it. So by one man's transgression or sin, sin entered, and by sin death entered. So all were appointed to death and hell. By one man's sin, all were appointed death. Remember the names of the patriarchy. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. That's applying to this story. Also applies to Jesus. God being the man, appointed to be mortal, to go through sorrow, 
but the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest. So God, in this one little story, which, you know, the cherry verse is picked out, but he says how you must be born again, get that spirit back that Adam lost, that the blessed God will come down. There's only one that will come down and that he will be lifted up as sin, put on the cross. And all we have to do is look upon him and believe on him. And that is how we are born again. And then, you know, we still see this. People say that God came to condemn the world and condemn sin and just, you know, point out sin and hate sin. And, and he's, he can't wait to bring the destruction of sin. He's bringing the destruction for the rejection of Jesus Christ. He's bringing the destruction for the worship of false gods and false idols, not for all the sin. He wiped out the sin to anyone who would believe. They were condemned already. They were condemned already by not believing. From day one, by one man's sin, death came. So, by one man's work, life reigned. He that believeth not is con or he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten of the Son. Yud he vav he, hand of grace, behold, nailed in grace, behold. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So, Jesus tells the gospel, but he tells it completely by all his stories and typologies. When you understand this, the love grows naturally. It is said, what's the number one commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy might and all thy strength and all thy heart and all thy mind. And so somebody hears that, they want to be obedient and they say, yes, I do. And they say, well, tell me about this God that you love with all your might. And they're like, uh, he died for our sins, you know? That's why you get a wishy-washy Christian. That's why you get somebody going to church, hasn't heard the stories, and maybe it was never born again. Not maybe. There are many in churches that are church people. They will be the ones saying, Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, open to us. And he'll say, I can't see you where you are. There is no born again spirit. The light will be taken. And it's the day of darkness. The, the day is seven years. But there's also a day of vengeance and the year of his recompense, the final year. Then he comes back covered in blood of the battle of Armageddon, and then heaven is opened, and then they see him on a white horse covered in a vesture dipped in blood, and behind him, the army of us. Can you see that one, honey? This is the heaven snapping back like a scroll. We're gonna go over this, I'm really happy about this. Uh, discovery that God led me to. As you keep pursuing, he orders your path through his word and he gives you new revelation. This got a brand new revelation. In Revelation 6, study this verse on your own and compare it to Isaiah 34 and Matthew 24. This is the heavens popping open like a scroll and everybody on earth sees the kings of the earth, the great men, they hide themselves and they ask the rocks to fall on them from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. This is going to be the great slaughter. And this is different than the end. This is exactly what was prophesied in Isaiah 34. And here's how you connect it. The indignation, the fury, the destruction, the slaughter. Look in the middle. The heavens shall be rolled together like a scroll. The host shall fall down like figs fallen off a fig tree. And his sword shall be bathed in blood. He's coming down for the judgment. Pause to read if you want to see the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of his recompense. Look at all the slaughter and fury. Again, in Revelation 6, 6 seal, 
The sun's black, the moon's blood, stars fall from heaven like figs shaken off a tree. Heaven departs like a scroll. The kings and the great men hide themselves. And they say, fall on us, we're scared to death. And in Matthew 24, look at the perfect comparison. As lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, like a scroll opened up. The sun darkened, the moon to blood, stars fall from heaven like shaken off a fig tree. They see the sign of the Son of Man, and everybody mourns. That means they are scared. They're seeing the wrath of the Lamb coming. This is the moment that they are seeing. And this is why the Lord takes us and hides us, shuts the door, and then goes and ex executes His fury. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers. Shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For the Lord is coming out of his place to punish. See, he hides us, then he goes out on his own. The earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. This is the battle of Armageddon where the blood is up to the horse's bridle. Again, he confirms it in the Song of Songs. He hides us in the secret place. He says, let me see you, let me hear you one more time. We say to him, take the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine. Remember Samson setting those foxes free in, with the burning tails. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn my love, come back to us, my beloved. You notice... The scroll snaps back, the sun is dark, the moon to blood, stars fall like fallen figs. That is a different story. He's on the throne, they're scared, and they say, save us from the wrath of the Lamb. He comes down alone, perhaps with angels, but he comes down, battle of Armageddon, where he battles with the sword of his mouth. Then, Revelation 19 now contrast this with a completely different picture. This is at the true end of the tribulation. Heaven is opened and you see a white horse. He that sat on him is faithful and true, and in righteousness does he judge and make war. His eyes are a flame of fire, on his head many crowns. He had a name written that nobody knew but himself. His vesture was dipped in blood. This is Yom Kippur. The blood came from the fury. Now he has armies behind him, following him. In, on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Yeah, I'm not kidding. He's in heaven is opened. He's sitting on a white horse. Here he's sitting on a throne. The scrolls rolled back. Here heaven is open. He's sitting on a white horse with a crown. His clothes is bathed in blood. Here it doesn't say his clothes are bathed in blood. All right? And he read the scripture on... Yom Kippur, Day of Judgment, and he said, I come to proclaim the year of liberty and the day of the vengeance of God. Year for a day, day for a year. The day of vengeance, the year of recompense, the year of his redeemed. Same thing. So this will happen on Yom Kippur, the year before the end of the tribulation. Israel will still be 80 years old. Then he comes back and gets us. Don't you love how it fits together? Okay, so all we got to say, when do we go? Well, I believe we go at Passover because all men must appear before the Lord in the, chase, in the place which he shall choose. Unleavened bread represents sinless. Who could be the only people to enjoy a sinless feast with him? It has to be people that were converted, that were, that were made incorruptible and immortal. So we celebrate as pearly white barley in the pearly gates, in the pearly heaven, in white singing songs at unleavened bread. Then God has another feast that he requires all men to show up. He shall descend on a cloud with fire and sound of a trumpet, and he'll give commandments. And he'll descend like he did with the pouring out the wine, and he will give the spirit that they can speak every language. This is when I believe the 144,000 witnesses will get the spirit of God to speak in every language and go throughout the world. The two witnesses will be in Jerusalem. We need people on the ground, boots on the ground, to go in every nation and speak this gospel. So, let me just stop here for a minute. Which feast, Mr. Bone, which feast of the 12 did Jesus fulfill when he was here? Uh, I'm going to see all of them. I think you're right, Mr. Bones, okay? So, 
He was born at trumpets. His blood was spilt at circumcision on atonement. He tabernacled with them. Then he went to the temple to consecrate the temple. He, the Feast of Trees, I'm not really sure how he did that, but, but you know, he, he, he's going to the Gentiles. That's what, that's what he, that would be, cover the trees, right? With Purim, uh, there was one that was wanting to destroy all the Jews, but he put them in protection. These are also fulfilled afterwards, again, with Hitler and Stalin at Purim. Over here, he obviously fulfilled Passover and unleavened bread and bringing the first fruits of the harvest. But the harvest is three parts. First fruits, main harvest, and then gleanings, the corners. Then he walked with them for seven. He fulfilled Shavuot because he had, this is a story about Jesus. This isn't about Moses. It's about Jesus. So he walked for seven and went up on Shavuot into the clouds, gave commandments in, in the book of Acts before he ascends. It says, after being seen of them 40 days, well, guess what? After one Sabbath, Moses was seen of them 40 days too. He just left out that seven day part. But it says when Jesus arose, he saw him and then he was not seen. He saw him the next day and then he was not seen. Then it said after eight days, he was seen and then he was not seen. And then he walked with them for 40 so, 15th day of the third month. He fulfilled being the first fruits of the Shavuot needs to fulfill the whole harvest of the wheat. And then with the gleanings, I'll just put this in in case I forget to put it in later. The gleanings are the four corners. They must be killed. So when you have a harvest, so we're going to be the main barley harvest, then the gleanings that were left behind in going to be the Gentile Christians, they must be killed. So Jesus took the first fruits of the barley, and the first fruits was holy, so the lump is now holy. That means the whole harvest. That is what he's going to come back for the main harvest of the barley. And then the gleanings will be left, and the gleanings must die. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed. We're going to be redeemed, but they shall be surely put to death. And that's why he says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Isn't that so cool? All right, and this, this is what I love. After fulfilling his part of Shavuot that needed to be fulfilled, then he, from heaven, poured out the wine, which is the Holy Spirit, and they were able, well, this now down here, was able to, they were able to speak in all languages. But that's pouring out the Holy Spirit. And then he had a witness stand up and say, these men are drunk on new wine. And there couldn't have been new wine back here. His wine starts to be harvested a couple weeks before Pentecost, month of Av. And it takes three weeks to make new wine. And then they consecrate it on that day. Jesus was also baptized on that day. That's when the Spirit descended on him, when he came out of the waters. This is the same time Samson pushed out the pillars. So we, we've also looked at this as a great uh, rapture scenario. And if you go up here, the first prophecy, this is a prophecy of Jesus, that he would release the Holy Spirit and the raven on the 9th and 10th of Av. So in these stories, we see a good spirit and also an evil spirit. Good spirit and an evil spirit. Good spirit dropped on Jesus. What immediately happens? He goes in the wilderness to be tested of Satan. Okay? So, and then I believe he fulfilled the Feast of Oil by anointing Paul. And then he's going to... So since he fulfilled everything, Mr. Bones, now he can come back and do it all again. So he'll start by these prophecies. Have they been repeated? Has, has the waters of the earth been... Start, you know, a wind, great wind, Passover, a Ruach, Holy Spirit, Passover, and then all of a sudden the water, all the people start to disappear? Has that happened? Have, have we, the children of Israel, been brought through the Red Sea? Have, have we, the, the children of, it, of the men of war of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, were we brought through by Joshua? His name is Yeshua, same name. Brought through, then circumcised of our flesh, and then eat Passover with them. And then what comes next? Jesus shows up with the sword, the, the uh, captain of the guard to bring the sword right after rapture. The sword's coming. And then 
They marched around for seven times will pass over this earth and Rahab will be saved out. Her name means large, like a lot. And so she's able to bring out all her family and goods and possessions. That's representing the Jews at the end. Okay? They walk, they, they encompass the earth. The, the flat earth people love this, but again, it's, it's just in typology, all right? But uh, as the earth turns, you on this earth, it looks like things are passing over you. But here's the big surprise. We revolve around God. It's really cool that he's in the center, immovable. Uh, and then we, we go around with blow trumpets. So it starts at trumpets, go around, blow some trumpets, but everybody's silent. And at the end, at the end of the seventh year, we come back shouting and blowing trumpets and all the stuff that's left is so much destruction, but the rest of it is falling flat so that everything can be remade. Veils removed. All right. What do you think of that, Mr. Miller? You like how it comes in and out? Oh, I just love it. And I am immovable. <laughs> All right, I just want to cover this real quick. Um, the word for throne and the word for full moon are the same word, kase. Okay, I'll show it. Okay, so God says that at... The appointed feast, there's three appointed feasts. All men shall appear before me. He's going to be on his throne, the Kase, but it's also the full moon. And look at the three feasts. Unleavened bread happens at a full moon. Shavuot, understand that how it truly is, happens at a full moon. Sukkot happens at a full moon. More testimony. So other uh, feasts that are full moon is Passover and um, also Purim and trees. It's just coincidental, but those aren't the ones required for to appear. Um, with Pentecost, that's seven Sabbaths would bring you to the first week, the first Sabbath and the next day, which would be the eighth of Av. That will give you a half moon. And then Yom Kippur is... On the 10th day, that's just a little past a half moon. Hanukkah is like three, three days less than a perfect second half of the moon. It's a, it would be a half moon at the 22nd, but it starts on the 25th. So imagine minusing three days from Hanukkah. So you got, it's kind of like a half, but it's a little bit of a sliver, a thick sliver. But if you put that compared to Day of Atonement, it fulfills the circle. So Day of Atonement is half plus three. Hanukkah is half minus three. Isn't that cool? Um, the Feast of Oil would be the last sliver of the moon. The Feast of Trumpets, the first sliver. So that kind of looks like an hourglass or if you put it together like an empty circle. And the Feast of First Fruits is also, it would be a full moon minus three days, so it looks like an opening of light with a stone rolling away. Isn't that cool? You like that, Mr. Bones? I was just looking at that. All right, I wanna go over one of the scariest verses in the Bible. It's about, you know, if you willfully sin, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna lose it. You're going, you have nothing to look forward to but the vengeance of God and hell. All right, but first I wanna cover 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Okay, 2, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. 2 Cor 9, 8. Let's kind of put us in a good frame of mind to explore this. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God, Yahweh, is able to make all grace, grace is unmerited favor, unmerited, undeserved favor of God, he is able to make all grace abound towards you, and that is more like explode towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to do every good work, and that all ability is like hunting you down, grace chasing you down and attacking you, his unmerited favor. So let's go to Hebrews and read 
this scary verse and see if we can decode this. Because when I struggled with it, I went to the Lord. I said, Father, I am having trouble. Will you lift your spirit within me that I can have understanding? And as he walked me through it, it's just the understanding came very clear. And I understand what this is talking about. So let's start with 1026. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So you became a Christian, you knew about Jesus, then you willfully sinned. But a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under the two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth to me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So you read that and you're like, oh, I received the truth. I'm a Christian. I'm trying not to sin, but I have sinned. And then you think about it. What sin is not a willful sin? Are you under hypnosis and a magic spell and you can't control yourself from sinning? No, you say, well, I sin, but I repent. Wait a second here. This doesn't say you can repent. If we willfully sin after we receive the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So that would include the sacrifice of our lips, which is repentance. Offer up the sacrifice of your lips, which is repentance towards God and praise. So, God bless whoever you're going towards and those that are going. So we need to look at this from the beginning. This is why it's so important to read the whole context. So let's start with the first part of chapter 10, for therein lies the truth. To when you reach 26, you are secure. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the thing, can never, with those sacrifices which were offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The law and sacrifice cannot make you perfect. And now we are cleansed of the law, made pure, sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood. So our repentance was to come to him. We're in a permanent state of we've turned from sin. So now we don't offer up a new sacrifice for each sin, including the sacrifice of the repentance of your lips. Now listen. For then they would not have ceased. If, if, if sacrifices were good, they wouldn't have ceased. Because of that, because that, the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscious of sins. This is really hard to understand. Okay, once you've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are washed from your sins. You are now supposed to have no more consciousness of sins. He says, the worshiper, once purged, Jesus did the purging, sanctified us, made us just, made us the righteousness of God in Christ. We should have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifice, there is a remembrance, again, made for sin every year. So when we are sin conscious and we're constantly in a fear and guilt conscious of the sin, and, and I have to go to God and I have to ask for forgiveness again. Oh, I'm sorry, I, sh I should be doing better. We're bringing up remembrance of the sin that he says, I will remember no more. For it, is, for it is not possible that the blood of bull and goats should take away sins, neither the repentance of your lips. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrificing and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above 
when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin thou wouldst not, neither had pleasure therein, which were offered by the law, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, the law covenant, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. I need to read that again. By the which will we are sanctified. So we are justified. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never taketh away sin. You have been now made kings and priests. Are you standing offering up the sacrifice of sins again by, by the sacrifice of your lips of repentance over and over and over? But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering... Whose? Jesus. By one offering. He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Who sanctified us? By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. You have to sometimes slowly chew through this, dwell on it, read it over and over to understand this. He's showing you the typology of of the bulls and goats that were offered over and over every year and continually offering for a little mini forgiveness. But you had to keep offering. Then he came to fulfill it once and for all, and he justified us, sanctified us, redeemed us, and made us the righteousness of God in him. So we are sanctified once and for all through his body. We are made perfect this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting, oh, I already read that. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are, I'm perfected forever by that one offering. So it is no longer responsible for me to keep up with how many times I tell God I'm still sorry. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness unto us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts and into their minds will I write them. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Why are you, some of you, continuing to bring your sins and iniquity to him when he says, I've perfected you and taken away your sins and I will remember them no more? Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering of sin. Did you catch that? This is the verse that saves us. If you willfully sin, there's no more sacrifice. Yeah, he already said that. Now, where remission of sin is, who did the remission? Jesus did the remission. Do you have to keep repenting every sin? Or are you in a permanent state of repentance? The Holy Spirit, he'll let you know. Do you go to him with guilt or do you go to him with thanks that it's already been done? Do you have to ask nice enough to be forgiven or is it done? If you walk away from sin consciousness, the ministry of death was written and engraved on stones. The ministry of condemnation. So if you are in guilt and condemnation, you are of no use to the kingdom of God. But when you walk in his unmerited favor and grace, then you can be a light in the world and draw people to his light of forgiveness, not of judgment. So he took away the sins once and for all. He sanctified us once and for all. By one offering, he hath made perfect forever them that are sanctified. The Holy Ghost was a witness. This was written beforehand. Their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. And where this remission is... There is no more offering for sin. You don't have to offer up more for your sins. It's done. I wonder if that's why he said, it is finished. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus Christ. You remember when he was crucified, oh, I'm sorry, down here. 
the veil split open. There was no more separation to the Holy of Holies. So that meant everybody could approach God. But I'm, I'm not good enough. I need to I hide myself. If you let his truth truly purge you and wash you, then you can understand you go to the Father. You say, in your precious work, your name, your salvation, your Yeshua, I come, I ask you, Father. Not just, in Jesus' name I pray, because he was a real good guy. I'm asking this, in Jesus' name I pray. No, I'm washed in Jesus, and I come to you asking, because you've washed me in your name. Yahweh, hand of grace, behold, nailed in grace, behold. Jesus saying, I and the Father are one. I am, before Abraham was, I am having the boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh was torn, just like that veil was torn. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. That's what he wants. He wants you to be purged of your sin guilt and draw near to him with a pure heart, full of assurance and faith, having our hearts washed clean from an evil conscience, having it washed clean of the evil consciousness and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the profession and our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. So you hold on to he did it all and was good enough. Don't start listening and clinging to, well, maybe I better start repenting more. I need to pray and ask for forgiveness more often. You're, you're, it's just like what the Catholic Church is trying to teach. They bring him down again. And you have to confess your sins at the, you know, to a little box to a guy listening. Call no man father upon this earth, for one is your father in heaven. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke to love and to good works. See, you're forgiven. You're washed clean. You're perfect. You can approach God. He will provide for you. He is your provider. Now, go out and help somebody else see this. Raise the dead. Wash somebody's blindness away. Open up the ears of the deaf. Help the lame to walk. You don't have to literally have their legs become supernatural and they can walk. That's great, but what's more important, they have this truth, and even if they're bedridden, they can still fly. Not forsaken the assembling together of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. You mean we're going to see the day approaching? Oh, yeah, I see it. It's, it's, it's right up. It's coming right up. All right. Now, after all that, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of truth. Look, there remaineth no more sacrifice of sin. That was it. If that's not good enough, I guess I'm not good enough for you. That's, that's the way that should be read. There's not going to be another. There was one. Hold fast to that. Cleanse your heart. Be sprinkled and purged clean of your sin conscience and approach him with a glad, open heart in love, in appreciation of forgiveness. The only thing remaining for those that reject the work of Jesus Christ is a fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law was a typology of what would happen when you despise Jesus' grace. How much more sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot, what are you trodden in underfoot? His work. He trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite insult to the Spirit of grace. So, you say... That's not good enough. I still have to be good. I still have to walk sinless. If I'm not getting a little more sinless each day, uh, I'm, I'm going to be left behind. You're walking under, trotting underfoot the Son of God, and you're counting His blood of that new covenant as an unholy thing. 
that blood that's covering me, that's not good enough if I'm still addicted to the pornography or if I'm drinking drinks, smoking, you know? If I, oh, what if I hate? What, what if I, I mean, this, this is the thing. People, people love to, to categorize sin, but I, I want to remind you what God said about sin. So jump to Revelation 21. Go down to verse 8. Again, the, the church people like to categorize sin, and they're like, if I, as long as I don't do the really big bad ones, then I'm okay on the others. But how does God look at? Are, are your sins washed away, or are you sin conscious? Are you still sinning as He defines sin? So look who He says won't inherit the kingdom of God. The fearful. You ever been afraid? You ever been worried? You ever been scared? That's the fearful will not inherit the kingdom of God. The unbelieving. Have you ever had doubts? The abominable. We say, oh, well, I'm not abominable. Six things are abominable to God. And some of it is, is uh, pretty easy. That's in, I think, Proverbs 6. We might cover that also. Murderers, but Jesus thought if you hate in your heart, you are murdering. Because it's the thought that counts. Whoremongers, you know, you, again, maybe you don't uh, go out and frequent uh, paid for prostitutes. But uh, are you dealing in, you know, in, in, in the world of the internet and, and TV and all that stuff with lust? Sorcerers, idolaters. Here's the thing. If God really looked at you, how many things in a... Christians' life are a worship of an idol. You know, we know all of the stars, Hollywood, sports stars, movie stars, record stars that we used to idolize, things in our life we used to idolize, maybe possessions, okay? Anything can be an idol. So again, if, if, if I was really looked at and I wasn't even sure if I'm still not holding something up as an idol, maybe a person like my lovely wife. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the fearful, the unbelieving, the idolaters, and all liars. So if I was judged by my sins, and he says, you know, there is no more. There's not another one coming. And you think you can repent it away. You have, your heart is not in the right place. Your heart needs to be on the Son of God was enough. His blood was enough. I'm purged clean. And yes, sin will fall off me like dead leaves off a thriving tree because that's what he promised would happen. But it's about getting your heart in the right confidence and understanding the gift. So don't trodden under feet the Son of God and don't count the blood of the covenant which he sanctified us as an unholy thing and don't insult or spit in the spirit of grace blasphemy against the holy spirit for we know him that saith vengeance belongeth unto me i will recompense saith the lord and again the lord shall judge his people it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god but call to remembrance the former days in the which when after ye were illuminated by the truth ye endured with great fight of affliction when affliction came before the word's sake, did you endure? Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and affliction. So you become a Christian and a lot of bad things happen to you and people can look at you and think, oh boy, he was better off before he was trying to be a Christian. And partly whilst you had became companions of them that were so used to being that way. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyful and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. So as things happen to us, and as we lost this and that kind of thing, we knew that everything we lose for his sake will be magnified in heaven. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. When you walk in Sounds a little weird. When you walk in his blood covering, 
you do have great reward. And when you walk, when you've been purged of a sin confidence and consciousness and go with confidence to the throne, to the holiest of holies, there is such reward. For you have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draweth back, here's the scary part. If any man draweth back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of they that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of our soul. You're saved by the believing in the Son of God and His blood as the, as the payment that redeemed us, justified us, sanctified us, and made us the righteousness of God in Christ. By believing that, not by your works. If you draw back from his work and lean on to you as your own God, I can do it. That's what Adam and Eve did. The knowledge of good and evil was they said, we can do it and we can make our own choices. It's the same thing that Abel and Cain fought. Abel brought the blood of the innocent lamb and God loved it. Cain brought his fruits of his labors and he was so proud of them and he couldn't believe God wouldn't accept him. And God said, I can't accept that because that's not the rules of the game. And he provided for him a ram that he could kill. And he said, sin lies at your door. But it was the sin of, I want to eat of the tree of good and evil. I want to do my own good works and bring it to you. And I'm not going to do this. So then sin overtook him because of hate and jealousy. And he killed Abel, just like what happened with Israel and Jesus. So when you draw back, that's not a backslider. That's not a guy that's fallen back into an old addiction or whatever, or hasn't read the Bible in years, but he, in his heart, at a time, he said, the Lord saved me a wretch, and I'm, I'm a worthless person. And maybe he has not heard enough of the truth, so what does he do? He beats himself up and he stays in his house, and he buries his talent in the ground. But you can raise the dead. Don't be those that draw back. We are not of them that draw back to perdition. Those that do draw back from the blood covering, you're doing it to perdition. That's hell. You're doing it to the loss of the salvation that was right in front of you because you walked out of the door and you said the blood's not enough. You have to believe all the way till the end. There's a couple of more verses on that. Let us seize and hold tight the confession not wavering. In Revelation 12, he says that these people were brought to heaven because they loved not their life unto death. So when their confession of Jesus Christ was, was sure, and then it came to the point, we're going to choppity chop, and they said, I won't renounce Christ. They loved not their life. Some people's life is their idol. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 10, the good fight of faith. Let me, let me just read a little bit of that. 2 Timothy 4, 1. Oops. You liking this, Mr. Bones? This is some heavy stuff there, Dr. Berry. Thank you. I always lose Timothy. Second Timothy, what did I say? Four, one through 10. I charge ye therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. At his appearing, the rapture in heaven, and at his kingdom when he comes back. Yes, there will be two more appearances. Actually three because he's coming alone to do some smoting. He will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine that Jesus Christ redeemed us with his blood. But after their own lust, they shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. You must keep the Sabbath perfectly and don't eat pork. Having itching ears, they shall turn away. What is the sound doctrine? You, is somebody going to challenge me that this is the sound doctrine? That we are saved by grace, by faith in Jesus' work and that his blood covers us? I hope not. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That also includes all these other false religions. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Make full proof of thy ministry. 
For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. This is Paul speaking. He knew he was about to die. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. You wonder, would it even be possible, someone who Jesus appeared to in person, to still have wavering faith? But he said it was a fight, a good fight, and he has kept the faith. You know, maybe he thought he imagined it at some times when, when times were tough. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not only to me, but unto all them that do love his appearing. Mr. Bones, you're going to love his appearing? Hallelujah! Okay. Be diligent. I come quickly. Cast not away your confidence. The just live by faith. Don't draw back. God sees right through lip service, hypocrisy, lying hearts. He knows the exact minute it actually is real. He knows the moment your confession understanding is real. Don't miss that pun. And he says, unless they should understand and I convert them. That's in the parable of the sowers. Many heard, sprouted up, said stuff. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't buy lip service, you know? So many, that is why they make judgment. Oh, this person's in the bars all the time. He's not saved. You don't know his heart. And he may be struggling with things you don't know. But he, God knew the moment before time. He knew exactly who would be. And that's what it means when he says he preordained them that would, that they were to be saved. But he didn't cause us to be saved. He knew exactly which one of us it would take. And it would be real. And he knew the moment, knows the moment, before time and after time. That's when he converts you. That's when you're born again. That is forever. When, when God sees that it is true, that you truly understand and have accepted it and cling to it, he knows that you'll never give it away. He also knows those that have said it and are acting like it, but they are going to give it away, and he will see them in the tribulation. All right, I think I've covered everything I wanted to. Oh, just real quick. These are things that happen between Passover and Shavuot. New covenants are made. And I have examples of all these through the Bible, of Abraham, Moses, and Noah, and Jesus. Coronations of kings happen, sacrifices happen, weddings happen, births happen, exits out, coming out, resurrections from the dead, crossing over, visits, raptures, rescues, promises, eating the first fruit of the land, great earthquakes, the book of the law, new temples, on and on and on. So it, it, it is a perfect timing. I believe it'll be around It'll be in Nissan, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure. I hope it's a little early before Passover and we celebrate it there, but you can't deny that 117, the first month, 17th day, would be the most perfect. And then after that, if it were to pass the final day of unleavened bread, which I believe is the 13th of April or 14th, depends on that sighting of the new sliver that's actually witnessed on earth, not what Stellarium says. Um, then we would then turn our eyes towards the Shavuot understanding. But this is by far and away. You can go back and watch my videos from a year ago. There's several of them on Passover and from two years ago. And that's when all this became created. And the, the number of reasons, it's just, it's just, it's almost obnoxious. That's why I didn't want to go through all of them again. This, we're focusing on what is the sinless feast that everyone must appear and how could we be sinless unless it's the rapture feast. He took the first fruits, but he did not take the complete harvest. The gleanings must be killed. Anything dedicated to the Lord may not be redeemed. So even if they get the truth in the tribulation, when they get the truth in the tribulation, they must be killed. So God says to them that are waiting on the altar, just wait till the rest of them that have to be killed, be killed. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. The four corner gleanings, the angels will gather from the four corners and then we'll all celebrate together. So that's just so cool. And again, points us back to the harvest and the barley harvest and the great Passover. I will, sh I'll leave you with some Stellarium because in Stellarium, will you hand me that right there? That thing right in front, the, uh, uh, no, the poster. Yeah. Stellarium is the most perfect of the raptures. The sun will be right about here. In between rapture fish and left behind fish, the lamb's hand, who's the lamb? Jesus, Aries, 
He's got his hand on the tie that binds. That's Rivka or Rebecca is the tie that binds. The tie is also on the beast. So after the rapture, rapture fish turns into my chains are gone. I've been set free. And then the next step is the bride who has adorned herself sitting on the little throne next to King Jesus, who has shish kebobbed a little lizard on his uh, skewer there. And right behind him is the dragon that will be cast out that was nagging, nagging, nagging and, and, uh, and, and reproaching God for our sakes. And they'll say, hallelujah, he's gone. He'll no more ever do that again. He can't approach the throne and tell any more lies. But that's rapture. The sun will be here in the first week of April, or first and second week. So at the 10th, which would be resurrection day, sun's right here. Come on, it's perfect. And there's got to be left behind. The left behind is heading towards uh, Aquarius pouring out judgment. And we know God's going to pour out judgment. And then the, after we're gone, the beast rises. That's the restrainer, the tie. So it's also perfect. And then right after that story, Taurus, the bull, Jesus Christ returning with the sword. And then the, the, the following snatching will be in the mid-tribulation. We know the two witnesses are snatched in the middle of the tribulation. Then there's a great earthquake. I suspect the 144,000 come up during that mid-tribulation because God says then he has redeemed them as a type of first fruits. So remember, at Passover, Jesus was, let's jump down here. Jesus was a first fruit by himself, the very, very first fruit, but then he brought a group of first fruits. So now when he ascended on Shavuot, he was the first, first, first fruit, but he has to bring a group of first fruit, and that's what the 144,000 are called. They are redeemed from the earth. And they are a type of first fruit. So then Jesus can continue to get the rest of the harvest of the wheat, which must be crushed. And then the gleanings must die. Okay? And so rapture man, rapture man, is uh, shown fulfilling the Shavuot by taking two kid goats and a, uh, a or a, a kid goat and two lambs of the first year. So if you're looking for the sun, moon, and stars, it, it, you can't get better than this. It's every single year when it comes around, we're like, this is the story of the rapture. So uh, I hope this was edifying, exciting, enlightening, and delightful. And I hope you're going to go out there and be a walking billboard for Christ. Let's put something on, ostentatious, and, and stand there with a smile on your face. I was thinking about having a, a sign, you know, on cardboard, we'll work for God. <laughs> I'm afraid with this hair, somebody's going to stop and give me money. So, uh, you know, uh, this is kind of a, an experiment. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of work and it's, it's kind of grisly sometimes, but um, hey, we'll see. All right, uh, do you have anything to add, my love? Mr. Bones, you got anything? I'm exhausted, can we go? Hey, where's my pie? <laughs> That's right, he never got his pecan pie. Oh, you scared me. One quick final wrap up. God is faithful and true to his word. He put the types and shadows in his word because he said, surely I must tell you. He said, behold, I tell you ahead of time. So when it comes to pass, like I said it would, you will know that I am. This is a testimony, not only to us, but to those left behind and especially to his beloved Israel. So, all of these stories will become crystal clear and then suddenly they will read the New Testament, the little book, for the first time. And in it, you see what sounded like legalism to some of us in the past. You'll see it as instructions that are perfect for the tribulation and what they will walk out in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. So I believe God said this is when I will bring you out at the Passover, around the Passover. I believe we're in the year, I believe he gave us the fig tree 
and the prophecies in Psalm 90, the prophecies from the beginning, so we would count the years. Ask yourself, if you don't believe that, why did he put in all of everybody's ages so we can count right up to our modern day? He gave us these clues that pop out, like Israel being born and being prophesied, and the Dome of the Rock, and the, the ten henchmen of Hitler being hung like the Book of Esther. These are for a reason. So we know we're on track. We believe, we understand the Shemitah, which again, changed everything. But if you read through Exodus 12, where he says, now this shall be the beginning of months for you, Nisan, he never changes it again. The Jews practice a lot of things that we have come to know God doesn't do. And so when he says, I hate your feasts and I won't smell your sacrifice, your solemn feasts, they're an abomination to me, it's because there's a blinder over them and they've gone astray and they're still trying to pave their own way, so to speak, cover their own sins. So it's not that much of a stretch to understand they don't understand this perfectly, but they will. And that's what the witnesses, the two witnesses, having Moses and Elijah here to instruct them is invaluable. For God to give power to the 144,000 to go throughout the world, this is how he will bring back unbelieving Israel. So I think we're about to leave. We have about 60 more days, if you will. So get out there and be a witness to anybody you can. Mr. Bones, continue to be unmovable. You can talk now. Oh, uh, have a lovely day. Be blessed, everyone. Preach the love of God, and we will see you next time. Oh, by the way, I figured out why I got shadow banned. I went back and watched the video, and uh, this was the only one, because I was talking about Jesus and preaching the gospel since the beginning, over 100 videos. But this is the only one where I told people, uh, not to watch the internet so much. <laughs> so I'm telling you now, watch the internet so very much and make sure and subscribe to all the new apps. And, uh, you know, here's a good uh, two and a half hours to start your watching of the internet. Be a big fan of the internet and maybe, you know, go, go partake of all of the healthcare services. Oh, Mr. Bones, what are you going to do? They're after us. Preach the love of God. Be rapture ready. <laughs> I see you in the clouds. What do you think of that? All right, let's go downtown in the middle of Times Square and be annoying. <laughs> be annoying? <laughs> be anointing.